through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 191. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Looper, yes. we're going to be talking about Bruce Willis. Kind of amazing we haven't talked about him before, <laughs> I know. but you know, hey, what do about... deserve some discussion. What a good time to do it, too. Definitely, we're going to do it for Cop Out. Oh. Oh. That one was... <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a... And we're not going to talk about Cop Out, either. We're copping out of that one. Oh, but... Um, <laughs> want to note that, uh, to give you an idea of how significant Bruce Willis is mm -hmm. like the dude has been nominated for a slew of awards in his career a lot of which we're not going to discuss you know he's been nominated for uh three Emmys two of which he's won one for uh Friends one for Moonlighting nice was uh nominated for four Golden Globes uh three of which were for Moonlighting one of which he won for Moonlighting awesome he has also been nominated for a couple Razzies mm. uh one for worst actor in 98 for or not when in 99 for Armageddon Mercury Rising and the Siege oh. and also in 1992 for uh, Hudson Hawk oh man come on Hudson Hawk he won that one too love Hudson Hawk or sorry he won the Razzie for worst screenplay for Hudson Hawk just nominate as an actor he shared that honor though so <laughs> Still like Hudson maybe, Hawk. Maybe you can write a... We'll uh, also not talk about Hudson Hawk. But the, We're the copping thing, out of that The thing too. that I find funny is that he also won the Blockbuster Favorite Actor Award for Armageddon. So if that tells you how much critical and uh, mainstream audiences differ, he's going to be one prime example of that that's, for that's sure. That's true. So, that's true. Definitely he has his ups and his downs. And I'll tell you, Armageddon, Mercury Rising, and The Siege. That's a, that's a tough uh, trio. I have a special connection to Mercury Rising. I went to school with the guy who died in his arms. In the opening scene, hmm. working horizon. Check that out, Hank Harris, hmm. right there, <laughs> coming at you. Let's begin though. The obvious place, 1988, mm -hmm. Die Hard. Yes, it's John McTiernan, mm -hmm. who I mean, it's, prolific director. Uh, being this was filmed while Moonlighting was still going on. Really? Yep. What a difference. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to realize that that he went transitions while still doing Moonlighting into this film. It's one of his first. Seems big. natural. Yeah. Just about the same. Yeah. yeah same show. <laughs> you know, in my opinion, this is one of the two definitive modern action films. I would agree. This and Terminator 2, I think, mm -hmm. set the template for all action films since, say, the late 80s, early 90s. I mean, things like Predator were obviously yes. important, and that occurred before this was also directed by John McTiernan. But <laughs> Die Hard... How surprising raised the scale of action and Terminator 2 to such a degree that it it became I mean like an arms race essentially yeah. where everyone each year was trying to like one up what had been it's done true. the last year and, and it was sequels pumping out exactly the franchise going the, the sort of cornerstone uh charming leading guys mm -hmm. that were sort of the franchise cornerstone your cop that just goes by his own rules yeah, I mean, I'm sure that had been certain, done before. Oh, I know, but that came back in its in its own, you know, fervent that Lethal Weapon later picked yes, up on yes. even more so. Yeah, I think that actually came out before this, but really, the first Lethal Weapon. Yeah, I think that was like '85 or something. No, '85. Yeah. No way. You're totally <laughs> wrong okay. on that. You can't any, be. Anyway, Thunderdome was even. <laughs> any anyway, you know, it's 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 funny because you know. This is so far long ago. Uh, also note, John DeBont, cinematography on uh, this one. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to bring it up every know, time we talk about this. But It's crazy to realize Alan Rickman's feature film debut. Yeah, you were telling me that before we started filming, and that is hard to fathom. I know. Um, Eight. But, I mean, you think about it. Boom, and... Lethal Weapon, 87. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Had to, had, to, had to throw that right. factoid in there. It's 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 just yeah it's crazy, it's to, crazy think. to think Alan Rickman is such a significant actor mm -hmm. over the last couple of decades yes. to think about this being his feature film debut. <laughs> but, I mean he's definitely done stuff before that. So yes. it's not like but like big you know big film. It's also interesting to realize that like uh, Bruce Willis received five million for this role and that was rather unprecedented considering the time and that he wasn't like a well-established yeah not like just a straight-up action star mm -hmm. at that point it's funny also that you know this film has spawned four three sequels work on four yeah and it's thought of as like this huge blockbuster film it only made 137 million dollars worldwide which if you actually look forward as we go through this list 
There's been a bunch of other films that he's done that have made a bunch more money than hmm. this that you would be surprised. Interesting. Yeah, so hmm. it only made about six, no, uh, not even five times his budget. Still, though. It's I mean, still, it's, I mean, it's, good it's still good. Still a good amount of money. Definitely successful, yes. but it's not quite as, like, prolific as uh. you sort of imagine when you think back in your memory and how yeah. awesome it is. You like, think it's like Star Wars or something totally, that yeah. broke totally. some mold. Yeah, totally. Huh. And it, it just, it's surprising that's uh, not Interesting much. also that, uh, the the director John McTiernan has found it necessary to do cuts whenever Hans Gruber was firing guns, mm. do smash cuts away as much as possible because Alan Rickman would flinch and grimace every time the gun was fired because he was still had, he was, was uncontrollable whenever the noise That's and muzzle funny. flash. And so actually, when you watch Rickman shoot a Takagi in it, mm-hmm. he you see him wince when he does it because he does just, <laughs> still wasn't used to that. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know. Also, I got to note that. As prolific as John McTiernan is, mm-hmm. um, you know, he's, he did Predator, he did Hunt for Red October, he did 13th Warrior, he did Thomas Crown Affair, he also did Last Action Hero, Roller Bar. Hey, and, come on, Last Action Hero? Uh, Roller Ball is not guy. so great. Basic. Roller Ball, okay, yeah. Uh, but he hasn't directed anything since 2003, and I'm not entirely sure huh. it's because of his ongoing legal troubles with the, was it the Anthony Pelicano wiretapping case. I know he might have to serve a year of time at some point now, but it seems hard to believe that almost a decade that's put Hmm. him out of the mix. He's not been in jail. He's not been in jail. I mean, he's done some great films. I mean, weird. Yeah. So I'd be curious to see what he does next. Mm -hmm. So moving on 1994. Yes. Pulp fiction. Yes. Let's step back to my previous point. $137 million for Die Hard. Yes. That cost $28 million to make. This $8 million made 213. <laughs> you know, of that 8 million, five of it went to just paying for the actors. Seems about right. I mean, seems fair. I mean, no, I'm, it's just amazing to think that everything else done with Pulp Fiction was basic, other than casting, was done on $3 million. Hey, you think about the important parts, Quinn Tarantino and Roger Avery, I'm sure they made, like, dick, bupkis. Um, but it's, it's so funny to think about this making, oh, not double <laughs> die hard but almost like it's yeah. almost a hundred million dollars more and it has more. like a f- quarter of the budget mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> it's crazy great i mean great great film obviously quinn tarantino one of the i don't know if you want to call it treasures of our generation but clearly i'd say treasure one of the most me, influential filmmakers of the last 20 years i would agree with that it's especially it's, american filmmakers I'd say worldwide, dude. You think about all the stuff his influences oh i'm it. not saying he doesn't have worldwide right. i'm saying uh, definitely you know, top in American filmmakers. Yeah, he's, he's definitely in that conversation for sure. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's it's the one thing that you gotta always give him credit for is casting. Like, when this film came out, John Travolta was essentially, I think he, he was crashing down yeah, his career. This is what he had really the decline gone. of, like, look who's talking was sort oh, of going on right. this. Like, he was essentially, you know, his career was sort of fading, and it was total just love of him that brought yes. Tarantino to him. And even beyond that, you know, you think uh, Tim Roth, Amanda Plummer yep. as the robbers in the beginning. Yep, their roles were written for them. So perfect. You know, uh, Samuel Jackson, I think... His arguably, role was written for him. <laughs> arguably one of the best performances of his career, if not the best. Uh, it, Bruce Willis is probably one of his most underappreciated roles. And that, is it really that underappreciated? I think if you think about his career, I don't think many people talk about him in terms of the context of hmm. Pulp Fiction. I think a lot of other people are talked about for Pulp Fiction, but I think he's sort of the forgotten I can, extra I, banana. I can kind of see that. I can see I, that. And I think he plays a very important role. I think he probably plays the most arguably dramatic role of the film in yeah. that he's a guy who sort of pushed the point that he has to throw a fight. He can't find it in himself to throw yes. the fight and he has to deal with the consequences. He has the most long torted backstory. Yeah, he has everybody. to deal with the yeah. consequences of not throwing the fight. He has to, you know, his father and the watch. Like mm-hmm. it's it's really him and killing John Travolta's yes. character. Like his role he, is so intricate. And interestingly enough his story book ends the whole movie because mm-hmm. he has the flashback of him as a kid and Zed the whole Zed's dead baby is the last chronological scene mm-hmm. in the film. Mm-hmm. Interesting, mm-hmm. but it's it's just so funny that you know so many people think of like the John Travolta, Samuel Jackson roles, or uh, Tim Roth and Amanda yes. Palmer, or yeah. even killing you know Phil Lamar, <laughs> yes, and, or Ving Rhames in The Gimp, like mm-hmm. you know, oh, so yeah. Marcellus Wallace, a great yeah. role as well. But you know, so and, ma- nobody really talks about Bruce Willis. And he's he's great. I, th- mm-hmm. I think it's one of my favorite per- performances. Yeah, I think. it's a really it's it's such a rare Bruce Willis role where he is. You know, playing the tough bad ga- badass like he does, but he is like 
inte- not the best guy- one there. No. He's usually like the most badass totally. person. So to see him Does play no a wrong. badass who is still like has people superior to him or is like has to p- bow to other people, sure. or, you yeah, know, un- the pressure, it's very interesting. It's really good. And again, also note the context of this in terms of the critical acclaim. You know, this film happened to occur at the same time as Forrest Gump, which yes. got a lot of uh, a lot of frustration by people that it didn't win. I mean, it was nominated for C. Uh, it won for writing, which is no Good. surprise. But it was nominated for Best Picture, lost to Forrest Gump. Travolta was nominated for Best Actor, lost to Hanks. Personally, I. I kind of like Hanks a lot in that role. I think he yeah. did very well. I think he's underappreciated, honestly. It is. But, you know, he, his performance is definitely the strongest I don't, part I don't, of Forrest Gump. In, in terms of Pulp Fiction, I don't think John Travolta is my favorite part. I think Correct. he's okay. Yeah, I, but I like, would agree. Yeah. Uh, you know, also Uma Thurman and Samuel Jackson were both uh, nominated. Uh, Samuel Jackson lost to Martin Landau for Ed Wood. Can't really get too freaked out yeah. about that. It was a great performance by Samuel mm-hmm. Jackson, but... Ed Wood's great as yeah, well. Yeah, it is. Uma Thurman lost to Diane Weist, though, for Bullets Over Broadway. And that one, I feel like, is probably the easiest argument that yeah. you might be able to have. Yeah, because it's one of Uma Thurman's better roles, too. Also, Tarantino lost to Zemeckis for Forrest Gump. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's like it's like Philip Seymour Hoffman. When you run into one of those buzzsaw films, it's just yeah. going to chop you down anyway. And I think Forrest Gump gets a lot of un... un uh, unnecessary blowback. I think Pulp Fiction's great. If it had won, I'd been cool with it. But... Force Gump, I think, is a great film as well, and I think it's sort of people. It's sort of, it's it's sort of aligned with films like Crash, where everyone's like, uh, I can't believe Crash won. I, I think Force Gump is vastly superior. In yeah, the discussion I, of that. I, yeah, oh, definitely. I just think it's also one of those movies that I don't think. Um, it's definitely much more populist. Yeah, I, I think I think it didn't stand the test of time as much as say like Pulp Fiction because a lot of sure. the things about Forrest Gump that were so amazing were amazing at that time like sure. the special effects sure, that you're were right. done and th- you're right. aspects of it so I feel like that's why in that arc, I think the story of Forrest Gump is great though I oh mean, it is I just, I think it definitely is don't get me wrong I'm just a big fan interestingly enough not surprising I think until South Park the South Park movie might have dethroned Pulp Fiction for the most swears but I do know I that, that. Uh, the word fuck is said 265 times in Pulp Fiction. Which, if you think about it, you know, if you think about the fact that, you know, the movie's probably only like two hours long, that's like, like two a, a minute. minute. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. On average, no matter what else is going on. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good. Fuck yeah! <laughs> America, <laughs> fuck yeah. Let's move on to uh, one of the films that I have a weird affinity for. As do I. And that is Last Man Standing. Yes. Uh, this is from director Walter Hill, who you might know as the director of 48 Hours or another 48 yes, Hours. the Nick Nolte, but, uh, Eddie Murphy, Buddy Cop. But the more interesting thing is he was a producer on all the Alien movies up through and including Prometheus. Really? Yeah. Alien to Prometheus. Like first Alien? Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, isn't that cool? Oh, yeah. That is. Yeah. So it is. I, I'm, so at least I'm he's a, been, you know, helping out in the right areas, even yeah. if he hasn't necessarily I mean, had all hits. I, it just gives me a newer, a bigger appreciation yeah. for it. Um, anyway, you know, this is inspired by uh, Akira Kurosawa's work. Yes. Um, like Fistful of Dollars. Yes, that is what I mean. Whole, it's, such, it's such a classic Western trope of a guy, uh, an unknown guy who sort of mm-hmm. rolls into town and pits two different groups yes. against each other. And, and all the different remakes have basically been just taking that those originals that were based on Dashiell Hammett noir stories mm. and just putting them in different time elements. You know, Jimbo being, you know, ancient samurai, right. Fistful of Dollars. But being it's, it's old really West. It's mostly become a Western trope. Oh yes, definitely, definitely. And this is the like I, I want to say it's the 30s maybe when it's supposed to take place uh, 20s it's prohibition okay so. so 20s yeah yeah and this puts it in the 20s era so actually even earlier than probably or around the time of the original noir that it was based mm. on but uh it, really interesting awesome bruce willis role well i mean it's great you know he's he's sort of he's pitting against the it was an irish mafia against the uh, with the italian mob yeah i believe so um for and there's Irish also mob like, versus and there's also a uh, Mexican military that's nearby that's mm. kind of involved, but it's near the border. I mean, it's great that you know he is essentially just this badass in the mm-hmm. West who I, I like that he wears a suit. Like yes. I like he's like still keeps his big city fedora. Yeah, he keeps his big city style going. Yes, and he's just like un un 
unrelent or un- unrelentingly yeah he just <laughs> kills like yeah. i mean it's he it, mows through that if down. anything like the biggest criticism i would say is it almost feels a little bit too modern in the mm. way he like his use of guns and stuff like that he just, i could see I, I love it the don't yeah. get me wrong i love the film i think it's great i love the um christopher Dual walken 44s. character yeah, I think that's one. Of the, like, I'm not a huge Christopher Walken fan, and this is one of the first roles I really appreciated he him is as. He's very of being intimidating tough. in that yeah. role. As, as Dicky, I think yeah, is his Dickie. character name. Yeah, no, Hickey. 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 Yeah, as sort of the enforcer for I think it's the Irish. Yeah, the he's Irish. been like out of town and has been feared by everyone. Yes. And comes back at the crux of the story. But it essentially, as you know, Bruce Willis using. Um, Guile and yeah, ex- bullets. Exactly. To <laughs> to make himself richer while also wrecking these yeah. two villainous groups or sort of ravaging this town. It's, yeah, uh, small town in the middle of nowhere that he kind of gets stranded in. Yeah. Yeah. Great great action film. I love it. It's a so, guilty pleasure for me as well. It's not even guilty pleasure. I just freaking love it. Sadly, <laughs> a bomb at the box office. Yes, but, you know, sadly. You can't always win. Exactly. We still like you. We do. Moving on to one of your favorites, mm-hmm. Fifth Element. Ah, yes. This is Luke the Besson. Yes, who directed The Professional and the Femme Nikita, mm-hmm. also producer on the uh, Transporter. Yes. As well as Taxi. We're not talking the shitty Jim, Jimmy Fallon one, though yes. he did produce that. If you've actually seen the original French ones, it's based on those are a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yes. They're uh, more of just like an action chase type movie. Pretty so, much. Yeah. Car chases. Much like District B13, which yeah. I forget if he, he was also, involved. He did. He so directed. It's very similar to that sort of feel. Mm-hmm. Love great. District B3. Yeah, great film. Fifth Element is uh, a great movie, and it's crazy to think that at the time it came out, it was the largest budget non Hollywood movie. I mean, ninety million dollars in nineteen ninety seven is a lot. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's... it was big, really, really big in that element. Uh, Luke Besson worked like wrote this original script for this in high school and continued to work on it throughout he's, his career. He's done a lot of writing work, and I don't think he gets a lot of credit for it. I mean, some of it's really not the greatest like i think Correct. he was a writer on taken for instance mm, which was great yes i think he's um, also involved in lockout or yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's he's very hit or miss yes. but you know he's he's he's, good. he's a creative dude like yes. i'll give him that yes it's true i mean and fifth element is a great story you know awesome sci-fi story it's nice to see bruce willis in a sci-fi role um kind of again playing a kind of ex-military begrudged badass but in this case playing a taxi driver I, I'm just a big fan of seeing Gary Oldman return after working with Luke yes. Besson on The Professional which yes. was a great role uh, great interestingly role. enough Bruce Willis and Gary Oldman's characters never meet or communicate with each other in any way throughout the whole film they are in fact unaware of each other's degree of involvement they never actually even are involved that's, in ser- funny. Searching that's almost other. the same as The Bourne Legacy Hmm. Jeremy Renner's character is completely unaware of uh, Edward Norton being after him. Edward Norton's sort of aware of, or he is aware of Jeremy yeah, Renner okay. and pursuing yeah. him, but like they never yeah. really cross paths hmm. or anything in the movie. But it's so just interesting to realize, funny. like when you think about it, because Gary Oldman is so villainous in the movie and yeah. Bruce Willis is so heroic, but then that that one point weird where they cross you... paths in the ship where they don't meet each other, where he. That's such a like classic Hollywood thing to have them the hero and the face villain off. Of, yeah, yeah, and that's so that's funny. totally the kind of thing that you know you can see uh, an interesting French director in a French movie house being like, no, we're gonna have it be completely different. In that t- element. Two of the most noble supporting roles are Mila Jovovich, yes. who blew up her career yes. following this and has gone on to do like a million Resident Evil or whatever. <laughs> uh, but you also had Chris Tucker, yeah. who I believe this was around the same time as Money Talks, but yeah, this right. is pre-Rush Hour. Correct. So he was just beginning to explode And I forget himself. when Friday came out. Uh, this, this is post-Friday. Pre- post-Friday? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, Friday was definitely what got him attention. Okay, period, okay. So. I forget when um, it lands. But yeah, yeah uh, also interesting to realize something I never... I never thought too deeply about but when you watch enough to, like special features and stuff with Luke Besson he's stated multiple times that the fifth element is sexual intercourse interesting yeah all right, good to know. Put that in your urban dictionary. Yeah, and also it's interesting that like they wanted Mia Jovovich's hair to look that way, so specifically that they dyed it so many times they ruined her hair. So she's wearing a wig for most of the movie. Because yeah, that's they probably actually... what they should have done in the first yeah, place. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Want to note? Uh, both Jov- Jovovich and mm-hmm. Tucker were nominated for Razzies oh, for their work here. Come on. And on the flip side, though, Jovovich was uh, nominated for Best Fight. At the MTV Awards. So, you know, again, you know, critical yeah. claims or yeah. interesting thing. If you really like the movie, you should see the DVD has one of those pop-up video style oh, cool. uh, 
trivia. It's in place of subtitles. It has trivia and it. It's there's a lot. Uh, they load it up. Note this: film made two hundred and sixty-four million dollars worldwide. Awesome. Almost twice as much as Die Hard. Crazy to think about. Awesome. Though the budget was like three times. More. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and it was like r- almost ten years later. Moving right along. Moving right along. We would be remiss if we did not discuss Bruce Willis and M Night Shyamalan. It's true. Obvious one would be The Sixth Sense. We're going to instead talk about Unbreakable. Yes. Um, Often I think overlooked. Yeah, I think totally. people remember how much sick they liked The Sixth Sense and remember how much they disliked later projects like yeah. Lady in the Water. Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, uh, depending on who you talk to, Unbreakable is the last good yes. one. Some people are still on board with Signs. Yes. I'm sort of middle of the road on Signs, yeah, though I, I, I think really like Unbreakable signs. is the last one I really liked. Agreed. And it's, I mean, it's a great idea, you know, the a, a real life superhero. Like, what would you do if you discovered that you could not be and, hurt yeah and this is post the huge i mean x-men was coming out right around this time right or had it been uh, out it's probably around so, the same time so you're t- i mean and, and same with spider-man so you're looking at like this is before this the, before the Spider-Man. huge yeah. superhero bump had been made so the idea of like a realistic hero not being done in like a kick-ass style but instead in like a very real world where mm-hmm. it's doesn't actually have superpowers necessarily and things are very kind of like just how you would think they would fall out. Well, I mean, it's, it, you take it even more a step beyond that to have like a real life super villain, True. or super villain, mm-hmm. real life villain played yeah. by Samuel L. Jackson's was it Mr. Glass? Yes. I believe is. Um, it's great. I mean, I think that's the the perfect sort of bookend to a guy who's unbreakable is a guy who always breaks. Yes. And you know, um, finding your purpose through him. You know, I, he, that Samuel Jackson character is always looking because if there is somebody who's unbreakable, it yes. means that there's a reason for him to exist. Mm-hmm. And so. then he can thus be now a villain. And so he starts being villainous. Which is kind of, I mean, there are a few things about this film that are kind of um, strange. Uh, number one, you know, there, there's talk about this being a whole trilogy. I don't know what uh, the reality of that was. Probably. I, th- I think M. Night Shyamalan said that was sort of blown out of proportion. Uh, um, I kind of wish it had been because it would have been cool. But also, I think the end title cards at the end of Unbreakable was terrible. I hated that. I forget. Where they're like, and he went on to be blah blah, Mr. Glass did mm. blah blah. It was just sort of like, oh, this is why are you doing this? This is so weird. I, it obviously didn't bother me that much because I didn't remember it happened. Um, I find that Spencer Treat Clark kid who played Bruce Willis' son incredibly unnerving. Like, <laughs> very creepy kid. Um, not 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 a fan of him. Like, he's really weird and creepy, even mm. though he has Spencer's name, which I normally am on board with. Um, it's, it, I think it's interesting things that, like, the, the awesome level of foreshadowing that this movie mm. does. Lots of stuff, like, for example, um, there's a lot of foreshadowing about Mr. Glass mm-hmm. with scenes with him involving Glass. Like, as a newborn, he's seen primarily reflected in mirrors mm. uh, as a young child he's seen reflected in a blank tv screen he leaves his calling card on a windshield he's reflected in a glass frame in his art gallery his walking stick is made of glass and then this one yeah, why would you have a glass walking and stick then this one were fragile i just think is neat because it's the kind of thing you would only notice like with a crazy pause and a uh-huh. insane comic lore errata which is comic books seen behind him in one scene are of thor who for a time in 1980s had a curse upon him where his bones were brittle and would break easily Wow, that that's some subtle nuance. Yeah. Good on you for that. I'm trying. I'm not trying I'm on. Yeah. Just get back to making movies like this. Seriously. This is what I enjoy so much more. Stop than Stop dealing stuff. with the fact that the twist means everything and making movies like Happening, and instead go back to trying to make movies that were interesting well, ideas. To be fair, he tried to do the twist here with Samuel Jackson being the villain. Yeah, I know, but it it didn't have as much oomph. No, not as much oomph. As Bruce Willis's career has gone on, though, you know he's had to play a lot more of the. Su- side character roles, more yes. part of an ensemble, which I think has benefited him a lot of the time, um, and I'm glad to see him do it. The first of which we're going to talk about, though, is the probably biggest of them, Sin City. Yes. Because he has his own story there Definitely. within Hardigan. Hardigan, which is the third and final one. Yes. I think it's technically called The Yellow Bastard, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think so. Which is or the, That's what the Sin City book yes, yeah, by Frank comic. Miller was called. Um, again, you know, it's probably been discussed before, but Frank Miller wrote a series of yes. novel or graphic, graphic novels. novels that they took three of them. Yes, three of the five, I think. I think there were six, six seven, or seven, seven, seven. Yeah, at this point, yeah. at least, and they just ran. Not even I won't say randomly, but they selected them out yes. of sequence mm-hmm. and just combined them together to create the film. And the only scene in the film that is not from those is the Josh Hartnett character, which is directed which, by Quentin Tarantino. 
Uh, no, he Quentin Tarantino did the car scene with uh, oh, did he? Benicio Del Toro and Clive mm -hmm. Owen. But uh, the beginning intro, which was done with Josh Hartnett, and I forget what the blonde's name is right now. I can't remember. She was in Pleasantville. Mary Swanson? No. Oh, uh, Marley Shelton? Marley Shelton, yes. That's who I was thinking. Mm. Yeah, her and Josh Hartnett, that scene in the beginning was actually done before the film had even started work mm. to show that they could do it. And it was a whole... They wrote a whole new thing for it and just made that to show the graphic style and to try to sell the movie. Yeah. I mean, they're they're picking up a couple of the different books, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of funny because there's one of which is the precursor to one of the stories in yes, Sin it's City, like a, yeah. a Dame to Kill, which was before yeah. Clive Owen became Clive Owen. Yes. So it's going to be interesting that. But, you know, of the three stories, got to say this is probably... My what I think is the weakest one. Hmm. Like I like I like the Mickey Rourke one probably the best. Marv. I love the Clive Owen one. I think yeah. he's great. And I mean, Bruce Willis is good, but I mean the story is kind of sort of it feels like a tack on at the end almost. Interesting. Like, like I, don't I feel that way. I, I I like you know his passion to save. Was it a uh, Nancy Callahan? Mm -hmm. It's good. I don't love Nick Stahl as the yellow bastard. I feel he's a little. A little too comic-y, if you ask me. I, I, I mean, I, I like, the, nothing about the Yellow Bastard isn't comic-y. Right. Just so you know. I right. mean, even in the original comic. Sure, I, I mean, it's comic. all comic-y, <laughs> but I, I just, I like the characters better in the mm. other ones. Um, I, I find it interesting in a, such a corrupt, twisted place as Sin City to get the role of a cop like Hardigan. Yeah, that's a different. That's a good. That's a good point. That's an interesting sort of perspective. And to see to how take. people try to corrupt him and how much yeah, time he spends he, in like, prison. He has to fight against the other cops. I, I think he. I think of the three main stories, he has the most tragic story. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, which I is mean, one of the reasons why I like it uh, so much. Because Clive Owen, you may not know... Cli no, know Clive this. Owens is definitely the most upbeat of them, I would it, say. Not only that, but Clive Owen is a murderer before he gets his face changed. That's the right. backstory that isn't talked about much. Is right. He's a serial killer. And Marv, like, even if he's doing the right thing, he's doing it through just killing well, people senselessly. I was just going to say, he's so. also killed, so that's kind of a downer. But, but, yeah. But, uh, like, I mean, you're right. Absolutely. It's definitely the most tragic of the three. Yeah. And, I mean, it's... And it has the... I just love the way he kills himself at the end sure it's also awesome. i mean you gotta you got i mean there's dramatic any, anyone who's you know imagined what it, they do to say like a, a pedophile or whatever yes. like can <laughs> definitely sort of like um what's it um it's cathartic yeah oh yeah for them yes. when he goes to town on the yellow <laughs> yes. bastard so yes. it's i mean stylistically it's a great film i, I mean i'm not going to complain I, I, de I definitely enjoyed the film a lot and uh Nick Stahl's nickname on set was the Blue Bastard because they actually had to have him color blue, blue because yeah. the yellow didn't reflect well on the green screen. Interestingly enough, this whole movie was done on Richard Rodriguez's studio at his at Robert his, or Robert Rodriguez's yeah. studio, Troublemaker Studio. Yeah, yeah, and he had like make people come in, and it was all green screen. It was one of the first fully digital films. Yeah, it, I, think, like, I mean Sky, Sky Captain, Captain the and then there was like tomorrow. one other, but those. It was right were there, yeah, it was really early on. Yeah. I mean, it definitely influenced things like uh, 300 oh, getting made well, yeah. quickly thereafter. It's also interesting that uh, Robert Rodriguez, who credits Frank Miller's visual style in the comic as being relevant to his own film, wanted Miller to receive a co-director credit because yeah. of that. And the Director's Guild of America wouldn't allow it. And yep. as a result, they only credit one director. Rodriguez resigned from the DGA. Yep. I did that. Interestingly enough, by doing so, it also caused him to relinquish his director seat on... The upcoming John Carter, which he was set at the time it was called Princess of Mars for Paramount. He Wait had already signed on and been announced as a director of that film when the DGA situation took place and been planning to begin shooting after wrapping Sin City. So because of this, Andrew Stanton got... Because of this, Rodriguez got kicked off of John... Got lost his director seat for John hmm. Carter, which he had, and then it went back to the trying to find a new person because it had already been announced that after Sin City, Robert Rodriguez was going to start work on Princess of Mars. So interestingly well, enough, because of that, it would have been weird to see what happened yeah, on Robert Rodriguez, guess, John Carter. I guess it also allowed Quentin Tarantino to be credited as a director as well. Yeah, that was an interesting thing because uh, Robert Rodriguez did, I think, I don't remember which soundtrack, maybe Pulp Fiction, did a soundtrack for Quentin Tarantino for a dollar. And Qu Quentin Tarantino said that he would repay him by. They've been close. I mean, yeah. like obviously they did Grindhouse together yes, and stuff yes. like that. So the After two of them are definitely yes. friends. So, yeah. 
Another sort of small supporting role in a film that I very much enjoy and I think is very underrated is Lucky Number Slevin. Another Josh Hartnett. Another Josh Star. Hartnett. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we didn't even talk about you know Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson reuniting from yes, Pulp Fiction. Yes, true. So uh, J yeah, Josh Hartnett you know, coming back again. Mm -hmm. um, this time, you know, a case of mistaken identity puts a guy in the middle of two warring um, mobsters. Mobs. Yeah, very uh, similar to Jimbo. Or uh, Last Man Standing. Last Man Standing. <laughs> unfortunately, this time, um, Bruce Willis plays a hickey kind of role. Yes. Where he's the assassin Enforcer who comes assassin. to town who's going to kill Mr. Josh. Mr. Good Cat. Yeah, Mr. yeah, exactly. Mr. Good Cat. I, I love... Um, I love just the story, the way they tell it. I yes. love the sort of um, fish out of water element of this guy, Josh Hartnett, is trying to figure out what to do when these <laughs> these different mobs are trying yeah. to make him sort of kill other members yeah. of each other. One's like Ben Kingsley. And the other's Morgan Freeman. Yes, that's right. The yes. boss and the rabbi. And they've ne they haven't left their their homes in like twenty years, yes. and they're two different like apartment buildings that look out towards mm -hmm. each other and, like, <laughs> so watching. many neat like totally noir-esque setup for the story it's great and there's great i mean great supporting roles like stanley tucci mm -hmm. phenomenal the detective yeah trying to find out what's the going on the hard-nosed detective and his role takes such an interesting turn <laughs> through the story it's just it's, i actually like lucy Liu in this which is every i, I don't i don't think like there's a, a that weak much. a weak link like honestly like you're, you're right like i generally i'm not a huge heart in it supporter yeah, same here um i'm not a huge lucy Liu enthusiast but all of them are just so perfect in yeah. their parts that it's it's just a great role and you know i i think it's vastly underrated I'm, I, every time it's on tv i watch it mm -hmm. and it's and so yet, fun it just it keeps it's one of those fast-paced movies that keeps you on your toes mm -hmm. where even if you see where things are going they change things fast enough and off enough mm -hmm. that you're kind of just enjoying watching the characters roll through this chaotic moment. Well, it's also it's such a funny film that you know it's it's so light from for uh for the majority of the film, and then they mm. twist yes. it here and there, and it becomes a much different film. Yes. And it's it's great when it when yes. it starts taking turns. You're like, whoa, are mm -hmm. we? This is pretty cool. Like, yeah. this is well done. Like, I didn't see that. You know. Yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, not not that spoilery but slightly spoilery uh the pseudonym alias for slevin in the end that he uses uh kelev kelevra yes yeah, Kelevra. is uh actually hebrew for bad dog which is an interesting which relation they to note good during cat. the movie yeah yeah bad dog good cat yeah so they they make they make note of that in the movie oh that's it? right it's been a while since i've seen it. yeah i forgot that yeah so it's it's a, still it's, an interesting it's definitely movie. cool yeah it's a great it's a great it's a great just well i mean mm -hmm. i'm sure that's not an accident but yeah. um, you know <laughs> yes, it's, it's just a very well be nice film. An yeah that'd be very serendipitous <laughs> but you know anyway that brings us to this friday which is the 28th uh -huh. we're talking looper from director ryan johnson probably the most the film i've anticipated the most after dark knight rises uh, there's so many good films this year. I mean, Django Unchained, hard, yes. hard pressed to not yeah. want to see that one. But I mean, Skyfalls, if we can get me up there. R R Ryan Johnson, I'm very a huge guy. fan of Ryan Johnson, and ever since he started talking about the fact of wanting to do a time travel movie and talking with uh, Shane Carruth, mm. I think is his name from from uh, Primer. From Primer. Yeah. I mean, that's all they needed for me, and then to add in the fact of Bruce Willis and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Who, playing the Joseph same Gordon character. Levitt's worked great with Ryan Jones, particularly in Brick. I mean, oh, he had yeah. one small scene in uh, Brothers Bloom That's as well, right, yeah. but uh, I mean, Brick is so amazing. So I love amazing. That film. I, I I was sort of middle of the road on Brothers Bloom, but mm. I love Brick. Brick was yeah. phenomenal. I, I, even regardless of how I feel about the story in Brothers Bloom, I think I mean, in terms of like creativity, it's it's great, and the visual agree. style, it's very entertaining as well. Yeah, and and I mean, even I even, even excited about em Emily Blunt. Uh, ah, she's great. I mean, she's, she's she's been great for a, a while. I I'm mean, also just interested because she seemed to show up pretty late in the trailers, and so I'm interested mm, to see what mm -hmm. role her character plays. And you gotta you gotta I'm gotta say there's a lot of appreciation to the effort they went to make Joseph Gordon Levitt look like a yes. younger Bruce Willis because obviously the story is about yes. uh, in the future the mob or whoever it is sends uh, people they want to kill back in time to yes. I think it's a looper is that yeah. what they call yeah. the guy, the guy who kills them? Yeah, he has looper guns. Yes, and so. In this and they story. kill them in the past so that they cease to exist in the future. Right. And unfortunately, it's like, what do you do if they send yourself back yes. to kill 
you yes. close that Yes, and that's loop. what Bruce Willis is, is an older version of Joseph Gordon-Levitt that is sent back, and yeah. hijinks ensue. Great great cast, I mean, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Bruce Willis, Emily got Blunt, the prosthetics. Paul Dano, mm -hmm. Jeff Daniels, I mean, lots and lots of good people involved with this. I'm very much looking yeah, forward to it. Yeah, I really like the concept for it. Sounds awesome. The acting uh, that Joseph Gordon-Levitt has done to try to get Bruce Willis's mannerisms, intonation yeah. and mannerisms down. I'm just, I really like the idea of taking two, making two you know, current live actors trying to be different portrayals of each other that are actually mm -hmm. interacting with each other. That seems like such a challenge. Like, it could so easily go wrong. Or... And you think about this, last or one of the last times we're supposed to do time travel, 12 Monkeys. Oh, yeah. Enjoyed that one very oh, much, yeah. though. So. Terry Gilliam. Let's see if you can keep it up with that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let us know your feedback and join us next time for our DVD rundown of the week of October 2nd. Yep. Wow. We're into October. October. Look at that. Ah. <laughs> and as always, you can give us feedback at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842, or on iTunes, Blip, Miro, Roku. Check in and get glue. And we will see you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to buy the sound style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.